I contacted her to help us with the presentation, and she says, I've got good news. I can get John Dugan to come. And I said, really? Because I've read his quarterly report um, over years, and I you know, really looked into his background and found he's been studying the economics of this region, Inland Empire, including San Bernardino, Riverside County, since 1966, if I'm not mistaken, John. That about what? 64. Well, <laughs> yes. And he is um, really a foremost ex expert on our economic outlook in this area. So the purpose of today was to give principals and district level administrators and, and board members, of course, an opportunity to hear the presentation on where our region is going economically. And I would like to thank Dina Walker. She was able to come. Thank you very much. She's one of our board members. And I'm appreciative that our cabinet level and district level administrators are here, Dr. Avala. He had to sacrifice the meeting that Ed is covering today to be here. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for being here, Tom, and all of the other directors who are here and principals. Now, as we've been talking about link learning pathways in the district and CTE pathways and demonstrating them, there's a requirement by Ed Code that we look at labor market information when we are establishing new pathways needed to review the pathways we have. So as we plan this work, I thought it was important for a variety of stakeholders to be exposed to the information because it may touch on any one of our departments to support pathway development from a fiscal standpoint. IT may, will have a role more than likely. Personnel will have a critical role. The principals in the school cycle have a role. Our EL department and the list goes on. And our middle schools, and thank you, Monique, for being here for the middle school principal. Thank you. And um, in planning, you need to know why do we make certain choices and what choices can we look at making in the future? Because things that we may have a passion for may not be a future for our students when it comes to graduating college and ready and actually majoring into a job, majoring in something in college or accessing a training program that's gonna lead to employment that requires high skills, training, and results in high wages well above a living wage so that they can establish a life for themselves as they may have dreamt. So what we don't want to do is just make decisions based on how we feel, what we like, and what's popular. We need to look at the real data and say, hey, we may have an existing pathway where we need to change the direction because now this is where the jobs are going to be in the future. So principals in your um, email, I did send you some data, some labor market data from the EDD, California Economic Development website, so that you can look at some things in greater detail that might come up in this presentation. And I was trying to save trees, so I sent you some spreadsheets that you can look at and review later with your team. But without further ado, I do want to introduce Dr. Hughes. Hi. My apology for being late. Uh, what I thought would be helpful to you is to have an understanding of how this economy is evolving, and then a lot of the issues that those of us who are on the business side of the equation uh, are looking at in terms of what we see needs to happen. If in fact we're gonna bring together what you do with your students and what they need in terms of their occupations. And so the speech I put together sort of goes through a lot of that. Just by way of qualification, I have been studying this region for 52 years. I started in 1964 <coughs> when I was teaching at San Bernardino Valley College at the ripe old age of 23. <coughs> Wrote my doctoral thesis on it and have done work on it in all that time. I've also when I was at San Bernardino Valley College teaching, I was also a teacher, but I also became the head of the business division, which essentially is a dean's position. So I worked on both sides of, of this monster and that. And also worked with the community college chancellors six years ago when they did their strategy for what the community colleges need to be doing. So I've been up to my ears in education for a long time. Let's take a look at the data, see what it's telling us, and then some of the strategies that uh, those of us in business are really seeing needs to take place. You see where I've got the arrow pointed? This economy is doing very well right now. Uh, it is the best it's done almost ever right now. When we look at the national economy, which sets the ocean of forces we swim in, you can see the Great Recession when we lost 
8.71 million jobs. You see three real tall bars there. Uh, don't get too excited, that was hiring census workers. You then see the four negative bars where we let them go. But after that, we've been growing for a long time. How much have we grown? The answer is we lost 8.71. We've gained back 14 million jobs. So we now have 5.3 million jobs, more than we've ever had in the history of the country. So, and the nice thing about this, there's been a lot of complaints politically about the pace of growth. I will tell you there's one advantage. We haven't found something really stupid. Get into the numbers. Stupid is giving away money on the mortgage market and then causing a crash. Stupid is the dot-com market going crazy and then crashing. We haven't got any of that in there right now. So we can't see the next recession yet. It's out there somewhere, there always is. But we still don't see it because we've been growing relatively slowly. One thing that is very important to our reason, one national set of numbers, and these are the only other ones I'll look at, uh, deals with the whole idea of the value of the dollar because it affects the Inland Empire uh, uh, quite, a, uh, quite a bit. Now why? We measure the value of the dollar on a scale of 100. So you can see back in 2000, that's pretty much where it was. The dollar got super strong in 01 and 02. Then it dough, and it gets down two years ago to the level I've got here. Now right now it is up there. So what happened in between is the dollar is 28% stronger than it was two years ago. Now to kind of put that in context, I really enjoy good wine. And there's a particular bottle of wine I've been trying to convince my wife to buy for me for years. It is called Montrachet. It is a French white burgundy. That bottle, two years ago, cost $4,000. Now, because the dollar is 28% stronger, it's now only 28.78. She still won't let me have one, but the fact is, it's getting in the range. <laughs> Now, the point of this, and I, it's actually a true story. I, I have to confess I own four bottles of that, but that's another whole story. But the fact is, anything we buy from the rest of the planet is now 28% cheaper to us because the dollar is so strong. Whether it's French wine or tools made in Germany or things made in China or wherever, across the board, Imports are less expensive. That drives the Inland Empire economy because a good deal of what we do is process imports. On the other hand, if you're a producer, you don't like this. Why? Because imports come in that can compete with you and your ability to sell to the rest of the world has deteriorated because your prices are 28% higher to them even if you didn't change it by a cent. So that is a very important metric for this particular region. Now the other metric is mortgage prices because one of our key sectors is the housing sector. It is the one that really hasn't recovered much yet. And you see that the mortgage rate, this is the lowest it's been in, God, my lifetime. And here we are just barely above that. So this, you know, if you're gonna buy a house, now's the time. You're never going to see rates this low again. Now, that's sort of the national environment. It's a very good environment for the Inland Empire. We go down to the state level. Uh, California in 2007 had 15.8 million jobs. We then had the big recession, and the state lost 1.2 million of those jobs. Big hit. Now, what's happened? In 2015, we're back to 16 million four. How did we get there? We added a million eight hundred thousand. Again, we outdid the recession at this point. We're up by 630,000 jobs in the state. Again, we're part of the state, so it influences us. Now, bringing it down to where you live and what you're most interested in is this region, the Inland Empire. What do we see here? Well, there's the Great Recession. We lost 140,000 jobs. It was 11, or almost 11% 11 of all the jobs in the Inland Empire evaporated in three years. 
unemployment rate went to 14.4%. That's as bad as the, one of the worst years of the Great Depression. Now, we've now seen growth here, 47.5, 55, 9, 58, 7. We're now, we've gained back in this period of time 196,000, we lost 140, so we're up 56,000 jobs higher than we've ever been before. Now that's where we sit as 2016 starts. This looks like what we're going to see in 2016, somewhere between 48 and 50,000 jobs. I sort of split the difference here. But those four years, if you look back historically, would be the four strongest years in the history of the Inland Empire. Now granted, two of those years were part of the recovery process. Two are the expansion process. So we have a good environment for your students to be leaving and going to work in. Now, job quality is a huge issue in the state and this region. The very high-end jobs that pay the best, we are very weak in. It was only 2.1% of our job growth between 2011 and 2015. That's the period of recovery and expansion. The state, it was 17.8%. So that is a missing piece of our economy. Now, there is good news, however. In the office moderate paying sectors, that would be uh, finance, insurance, real estate, health care, uh, as well as, by the way, K through 12, you're in there. Forty-five to fifty-five thousand dollar median pay, half above, half below. Thirteen point one percent of the state's jobs were in those sectors. Ours it was sixteen point three. But the real difference is down here in the blue collar sectors. The state only twenty point seven percent of its job growth. For us, almost forty. Now, what's the difference? Why that? The answer is because we have such competitive advantages for logistics, manufacturing, and construction, that those sectors are doing well here, even though the California legislature is doing everything in its power to destroy all three of those sectors. Uh, I am not a fan of the state legislature, you will hear as we go along. Frankly, I think we should send them to Guam and then sink the island. <laughs> but the, yeah. Is that mainly warehousing jobs? Like the warehousing, well, it's warehousing, trucking, construction. You'll see the, you'll see the, the, the biggest group is, is logistics, no question. But there is a lot of construction in there. It's our second fastest growing sector now. And there is also a, um, a about 10,000 jobs that were gained in manufacturing, which, by the way, is 20% of all the manufacturing jobs gained in the state were gained here. Now, the oddity of all this is we look at the sectors that don't pay well, paying median of 30,000 and below, and what do we find? 48% of the state, 42% of the Inland Empire. We actually do better than the state at that low end. And it's largely because we have a large blue collar base in this region. Our three big sectors all pay at a median 45 to 55,000, the three uh, blue collar sectors. I'll look at that in a minute. Uh, last year, we created 58,000 jobs, almost, almost 59. LA beat us, but who is behind us? San Francisco area, which is Marin County, San Francisco, San Mateo. Uh, Orange County was about 12,000 behind us. Silicon Valley, is uh, 17,000 jobs behind us. Now, all we ever hear about is California is driven by Silicon Valley and the Bay Area. With all due respect, the big job growth was in LA and the Inland Empire. And this is one of the issues we constantly face uh, in that everybody's got their eyes dazzled by what goes on up there. Granted, it is extremely high paying, very high educated, all the rest of it. But the fact is the job creation and the quality of the job creation overall in the state is better here. Unemployment rate, you can see that blue arrow, that was the worst. It hit 14.4 when the state was just under, uh, when the US was just under 10. We're now down, these are unadjusted data, we don't put seasonality in local data. 
5.8 here in February, 5.2 nationally. So instead of being 5% over the national rate, it's a half a percent. So we're closing in on that. Now, our biggest issue as a region is poverty. A quarter of our children are living in, if it was a family of four, the four people are living on $2,000 a month or less. Uh, for everybody, it's 18.2. You'll notice LA is in a little worse shape than we are, and then the Central Valley is in a lot worse shape. You may wonder why the inland counties tend to be poorer. The answer is because this is where people came for affordable apartments and rents. This is where they came for affordable houses. Part of this is frankly the result of California policy. The California Environmental Quality Act is so misused by NIMBYs and others to stop housing in the coastal counties that their housing prices have gone sky high. So if you're marginally educated and you don't have a really high income, you have to move inland. Uh, it is interesting that it is the Democratic parties, and by the way, I should tell you, I ran campaigns for Willie Brown. I put five guys in his, in his caucus back when he was speaker. I am so disgusted by where the Democratic Party leadership went because they're hurting the constituents of their own party. And SEEK was one good example because they're forcing people to come inland. And it means we deal with the consequences of the fact that there's no housing being built in the coast and they will not change that law to fix the, the fact that it's being abused. Sorry, that's me. I don't know who that is, sorry. Okay, now, this is the other issue that goes along with it, high school or less uh, educational attainment. 47.1% of this county's population, adults 25 and over, high school or less. Riverside County, just a little tiny bit better at 45.7. The worst is the Central Valley, but again, this is that following where the housing is affordable has led to that kind of a result and your challenge because an awful lot of your students, in fact, their parents do not understand a lot about what the whole educational environment is all about. A couple of last statistics. This area has 4.46 million people as of last July. We passed Kentucky, so half the US states have less people in them than these two counties. So we don't deal with county and inland empire issues. This is a state without a government. You notice Oregon is four million. We're a half a million larger than the population of Oregon in these two counties. Population growth, it is anticipated that we will reach 5.9 million by 2040, the forecast from Skag is we'll add another million <coughs> 46. That's more than Los Angeles, and it's more than San Diego, Orange, Imperial, and Ventura combined. <coughs> In terms of job growth, we'll basically grow about the same speed as LA, and uh, just a little bit slower than San Diego, Orange, Imperial, and Ventura. So we are, in fact, a big, important area. Unfortunately, we're in California where the state itself is just so gigantic. Now, a little bit about how the economy actually operates. Think of a Clint Eastwood movie. These two guys find gold. What do you do with it? Can't do much. So they ship it away, and money goes to these guys. Now, you now have the basis for an economy. Without some activity that brings money into the area, you don't have a basis for an economy. So it's not retail or all of that kind of stuff. It's whatever brings the dollars to the area. Now, if they have needs, what do they need? Well, they need food and tools. So the general store. No miners, no general store. You have a ghost town. What else do they need? Well, they need entertainment. So you have the saloon. No miners, no people working at the saloon. Miners have other needs, but we should probably skip that. <laughs> <laughs> I used to run a casino in Nevada, so you can understand I have this sort of odd point of view. 
Now, what are the gold mines? What brings the money in here? Well, first of all, it's logistics, as was correctly asked, hugely important. Uh, construction is now our second most important sector again, as it used to be the first. Healthcare, way up there. Manufacturing, in an odd way, is a very important sector for us. And then we're getting a little bit of high-end work, kind of the sort of thing you see at Kelly Space and Technology over at Norton Air Force Base, where there's about 120 people working in aerospace. They then give you the modern secondary tour. So you have consumer services, you have retailing. These sectors up here, which we talk, call secondary tier, largely population serving, those jobs tend to be lower paid. Uh, that's sort of the initial thing you see grow up in an area. Now, how do you devise a strategy relating what goes on in the business community that your students are going to ultimately be hired by uh, when you're an educator? The first thing that I've come to the conclusion, we should never depend on you to have to figure out the answer. It's really up to the business community to figure out the answer and inform you of that. So an outreach strategy, first of all, is the community has to come to the conclusion that this is a priority. And if they don't, this area will never thrive completely. It'll grow, but it'll always have these major problems underneath it. So this is hugely important. Businesses, we believe, need to be ones to help convene what needs to take place with educators to move the process ahead because we have the power to move things around and not, not everyone does. So the idea is to bring together the bi-county educational leaders, uh, and we've done this, and it's been very successful, uh, to design essentially a cohesive strategy on how do we move forward. Uh, when we're going to go to the legislature, one of the problems the Inland Empire has had is Riverside's got its strategy, Ontario's got its strategy, the High Desert has theirs, San Bernardino and this area has its own, and we go up there and we look like idiots. So one of the things that we recently did is we pulled together the five county educators, put together a single proposal, brought it to one of the nine, well, brought it to the, the governor's office, and that's where the $5 million grant uh, went to Cal State San Bernardino to work on additional college uh, preparedness and college passage. And frankly, it's because we hit heads together. That's the way it came about. We said enough of this, everybody's got their own idea, doesn't work. So you need to get competitiveness between districts out of the mix. Business needs to provide a lot of the backbone support for what it is you're trying to do to drive the process, to coordinate endorsements. Uh, frankly, if the community colleges can't respond when we're trying to get some things <coughs> done, we're gonna just tell them we're going to the private sector. We haven't got time for you to figure out, oh, there's a course we need. Two years later, it's out of the curriculum committee. With all due respect, that by <coughs> two years later, those jobs are probably gone. We don't have time for that. Then we have some things we think are very helpful. AB 86 we think is very helpful because it's bringing together the kind of folks working in the adult schools, the ROPs, current technical education, and that's got to be a key piece of the puzzle because it's not just academic, though academic is very important. It's also the technical skills. Now, just as an illustration, the launch initiative is something we put together at the Inland Empire Economic Partnership. Now, this doesn't apply to your students, it applies to their parents. But one of the things that we've come to the conclusion is the whole system of taking care of people and, that are poor essentially has one, and one result, and that is to keep them there, to keep them poor. Not that we want to keep them poor, it's just the structure of the programs are such is that is the outcome. And so one of the things we've been doing is working with um, the president of the San Bernardino School Board, Mike Gallo, who has, heads up Kelly Space and Technology. And we put together a program where 
first thing we had to do was get our board of directors to decide poverty is not in their interest. It's not in their interest in terms of customers. It's not in their interest in terms of labor force. So these things needed to be fixed. So we created a strategy where, first of all, you're going to work with the housing people to get them secure housing. Second, you're going to give them income, child support, transportation, all that. But one of the things we're doing is we are not relying on any agency. We're relying on all of the agencies. And so we've worked with both counties, with all of their departments, to where we're going to try a test case where we're trying to move people from the housing through this and from there directly into training in jobs that business says these occupations, these qualifications these certifications. So the skills and the certification and the speed of training will be set by the business sector. They then will prioritize interviews for anybody that makes it through the process to hire them. Because if you've secured the folks and given them the training, they are going to be good employees. This is not a welfare strategy. It's an economic development strategy built around education. We've gotten $385,000 to do this from the Irvine Foundation. We're starting out the pilot program, hopefully uh, starting early next, uh, early later this year. We, we're looking for about a million and a half to $2 million to try the first phase of this. And we're also talking to people in Washington about putting up the dollars to expand it to the level of the issue we have in the Inland Empire, because there's a bottom line. You get this to work, you're going to save the taxpayers an enormous amount of money, as well as help a heck of a lot of people get out of the circumstances that they're trapped into. Uh, we've got an agreement by every county agency involved. Uh, the agencies, when they come to us, those of you in education, I have to tell you, their frustration is when they do get people ready, they can't find anybody to do the training. Yes, ma'am. So two questions. Um, for the launch initiative, is there a specific, a specific community that it will be piloted in? It's so aimed at six communities in the region. Uh, it's aimed at San Bernardino Rialto. Mm -hmm. It's aimed at Ontario Montclair. It's aimed at the Victor Valley in Riverside County, Riverside City, Moreno Valley, Paris, and Coachella. Okay. And then is there an age group target for this initiative as well? Really, no. What it's aimed at is family groups, not just a single individual in the family. Yeah. It's going to be probably mostly female head of household, no male present, multiple children. Uh, also veterans are one of the targets. Uh, those are the, I think those are two of the main targets. Uh, but we're going to try and diversify it enough to get data off of it that tells us, is this working? What, and one of the things we hope to uncover is where is the law in the, in the way? Where are the agencies in the way? Federal, state, and local. That's a, that's a piece of, in a sense, this is, we're diving into a thicket, and we're sure that we're going to uncover all sorts of issues. Now, key elements, industry-defined jobs, industry-defined standards, certifications, and speed of training, business assisting the schools by setting standards and certifications, <laughs> providing access for schools to take their students to come in and look at What's the jobs look like? Company tours. Well, school visitations is when they come to school. What I'm doing right now, only with students, which I, by the way, do, and it's really a kick. <laughs> Job shadowing, where somebody gets to follow some, you know, if you're going to want to be a nurse, well, let's go find out what that looks like. Internships, externships for teachers, so they have an idea of the relationship between what they're teaching and what's going on in the workplace. And then business will be hiring those who get certifications out of these processes. Key pieces that we think need to really be stressed, STEM, certainly soft skills. Uh, when you talk to businesses, the thing that drives them nuts is if somebody comes to work on Monday, it would be really nice if they dropped by on Tuesday. <laughs> and we have a whole generation that doesn't understand what I just said. You laugh because you're too old to understand what the millennials Cradle career, absolutely essential. 
uh, College Access Foundation, I'm about to go out and interview 75 companies, CEOs and heads of departments and whatever, to understand what jobs are the growing jobs, what do they pay, what are the qualifications, which companies are growing, what are the issues that they see uh, going forward. I do this about, well, I about did it about six years ago, I'm about to redo it this year. I don't meet with people in groups. I meet with them one-on-one -on -one in their offices. One of the messages I will give you, if you want business to help you, don't ever invite them to a campus. Go see them. And they will tell you everything, because they're proud of their businesses. And then the whole link learning process, and then what we have uh, called the healthcare convergence, where we're working with the CEOs now and the hospitals to work with the various elements, because a lot of the jobs that are going begging are within the healthcare field. Now let's talk about that particular piece of the puzzle. So I'm gonna look at that left-hand corner, which is where the, the important sectors are. First, healthcare. Between 2011 and 2015, that was 12% of our job growth during those Again, that's the recovery and expansion. 22,967 jobs created. Median pay, half above, half below, 54, 261. So these are good paying jobs. And they aren't all doctors and nurses. In fact, I, by the way, my forecast, I anticipate 4,000 jobs in this field being created this next year we're in right now. Now why? Well, back in 2010, we had 40 people for every healthcare worker in the Inland Empire. The state average was roughly 30. Now we're at 35 and the state's at 28. So instead of having 36 and a half percent more people, we have 27.7. We're still understaffed. If you've ever been to a hospital or anywhere to get service in the healthcare industry, you know what I'm talking about. It's just we're understaffed. Now, understaffed in what? Well, take a look at those occupations. None of these is a college graduate, or some of them might be, but they're mostly not. They're mostly jobs where people can have technical skills and work and make very good money in the whole healthcare field. Uh, all of those various sectors, uh, it is an amazing group, and every one of those does very, very well. Uh, I recently, well, not recently, two years ago, had um, spinal surgery. And one of the things I did was I interviewed virtually everybody I came in contact with. Where were you educated? How, why are you in this particular field? Where is it? What's your next step? And I mean, that's what I do for a living, so I figured out I was going through this process until they knocked me out and just before they carved away my, half my spine. <laughs> so I'm talking to the nurse that's <laughs> the anesthesiologist that she's doing that. But the fact is, there are very good jobs, and once you get into the field, you find your way around. One of, the, one of the people I talked with very early on was a nurse's aide. And she was living in her car before she got her job. She got a little bit of training, got her job. Uh, she's now moving up the ladder because once she got to work, what did she realize? Heck, I can do this stuff. And I could do some of it as, better, as well as these other people and they're a little smarter than I am. But you had to, she had to get into that mix. So this is a dynamite field. And it's why we're working on the convergence between the hospitals and other kinds of health providers together with trainers to get after fixing this. And then of course, and you will see this every time, you don't only have to train for these things, you need to train the soft skills. I swear if I could open up every child's head to say, excuse me, don't be stupid. However, you know, I have teenage grandson. Now, logistics, hugely important sector for us. This is where the value of the dollar comes into play. Uh, 
That is what's going on in the field. You don't see a lot of people in that picture. What's happening in logistics is it started out with people picking up boxes. It is evolving over, if you don't understand information technology, you're not gonna work in these fields. It's that simple, that's where it's headed. Uh, efficiency always goes in that direction and that's where it's headed in this particular case. Now, these show you the number of 20-foot equivalent containers in the red bars entering through the ports of LA and Long Beach. It's no longer estimated, it's what happened in 2015. 2015 and 2014 tied to the third biggest year in the history of the, of the two ports. They handle 40% of all the containers entering the United States. So who's second? Who cares? It's so far behind, it's like a third of what we're doing in those two ports. Will the Panama Canal affect it? No. Why not? Because the ships that they're using now are bigger than the new Panama Canal can handle. They built a canal, spent billions of dollars, and it's already obsolete. Because it, just in this example, just recently, the Benjamin Franklin, which is owned by um, CMA CGM, a French company. And the Benjamin Franklin pulled up. The Benjamin Franklin has 18,000 20 foot equivalent containers on its desk. If you lined them up end to end, they would go from Santa Monica to beyond Santa Barbara. It has a crew of 27. That shows you the efficiency that's getting into this kind of a business. Uh, it is so big that when it went into San Francisco Bay, it cleared the Golden Gate Bridge by 20 feet. Wow. If you've ever stood up there and looked down, it's extraordinary. Now, sorry. What did I do? Oh, I killed it. There. Back up. This is exports. And you can see them growing. This is 36, 36, 35. The dollar went up in value and exports went down. That's the kind of stuff economists look for to see that we actually may know what we're talking about. Now, just show of hands, who in here did not buy something online for Christmas last December? Raise your hand. One, two, three, two, three. Three of you lose your American citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the I fact care. of the matter is, that's what we do. We're buying online now. Well, buying online essentially means you need to have some place that can handle getting those goods ready to get them to you, and you want them right away. You want them within 24 hours. Well, the kinds of facilities to do that, the smaller of them are 500,000 square feet, the bigger ones go up to a million and a half square feet. Uh, Amazon just, uh, dot com just opened their seventh Inland Empire facility to handle this sort of stuff. But it's not just Amazon, it's everybody. So these two things have created a huge advantage to the Inland Empire. We're near the ports and we have room to build these facilities to handle Southern California's e-commerce. Yeah. I just had a question. Aren't they using robots a lot more too in the Amazon warehouses? Well, the so robots. Less people in the future? Well, the movement is always in that direction. <coughs> but if you think of robots as you know somebody walking around, no, this the robots were all that equipment we saw a minute ago. Information technology is all of that stuff. Uh, it may be a, like a, over at the um, uh, facility on the 60 freeway there were. The shoe, what's the shoe company over there? Skechers. Ske Skechers. Uh, the Skechers, Skechers facility. Yeah. Nobody works inside that building. Mm -hmm. There's 600 people working there, but none of them are inside. Mm -hmm. Inside, it's just all machinery operating. Nobody touches a box, a shoe, any, a crate, wow. anything. So it's the care and feeding of the technology. Well, that is requiring more and more levels of education to be able to handle all that stuff. But it's not robots in the sense of moving around sort of thing. Now, this is how fast e-commerce is growing. 15% compounded. How 
much like your 401k to keep going up 15%, 15%. But you can see it's just been a horizontal line since 2010. And it's going to continue growing like this because, let's face it, I mean, I want to take my phone away from my wife. <laughs> Any of you tell her that, it'll be my fourth divorce. Be quiet. <laughs> now, look at the share of jobs directly in these fields. 23% of all of our job growth. Darn near one out of four jobs were, are being created in that particular field. And remember, these jobs support the gold miners. When they go to Stater Brothers, when they go anywhere, and you know, they go to a hair salon, they go wherever, pizza parlor, that whole secondary tier is operating off the same money that these guys bring. So this is huge for us. Medium pay, 45, 677. In this field, there are 155 different occupations. If you look at the array of pay within those occupations, the, the entry level is at about 1250. And we got a bunch of people say, oh, they're terrible paying. The entry level is 1250. Anything entry level is poor paying to a person with no background and no education. But if you get in the field, Half the people in the field make over 45 cents. Half make under. And 83% of the workers in this field today are in jobs requiring a high school or less, which means 33% of them were making more than 45,000 with that kind of educational background uh, qualification to be in their field. So this is a powerful upward mobility as the medical thing is. Logistics this last year created 12,983 jobs. I'm forecasting 2016, it'll add another 13,000. Very strong sector. The training issue here, what do we need? Truck drivers. <laughs> you don't train truck drivers, but there is a huge shortage of truck drivers. And they make really good money. <coughs> Diesel, CNG, and LNG mechanics. Uh, the technological changes in the work environment, working on robotic equipment, information technology, environmental systems, and then again, soft skills. Come to work on Monday, drop by on Tuesday. The big issue in this field, frankly, is the, the, the fight between the environmental thought and the creation of these particular kinds of jobs. Here is our difficulty this is the worst spot in Southern California back in 2001 for PM 2.5, which is the particulate matter that comes out of diesel engine. It was 120 days over the federal standard. Where was it in 2014, the most recent numbers available? 5.3. And between 2001 and 2014, we added over 200 million square feet of occupied businesses drawing trucks. Given that fact, how did that happen? The answer is the engines have changed. The 2007 and 2010 engines, which are increasingly required on the trucks, are that much cleaner. Are is the environmental movement happy with this? No, they want to push it farther. The problem is there's a point at which the companies say, Phoenix doesn't look that bad, neither does Vegas. Who gets hurt? Not the companies. It's the workers. And that is the, the whole fight that you see my name in the paper uh, all the time about people screaming at me here in some of the speeches I've had. All right, now, here we have manufacturing. Here's the problem. The United States, 883,000 manufacturing jobs from January 2010 to January 2016. California, 47,000. That is only 5.4% of U.S. growth. Why? Because manufacturers don't want to be here. Why don't they want to be here? Because of our environmental policies. Just take a look at this one chart. Electrical energy. Electrical energy, California, in July, $13.3 or 13 per kilowatt hour. The second highest west of the Mississippi, Nevada at 928. How much higher are we? 
Tesla went to Nevada, big shock. Now let's find another nearby state. Here's Arizona, 697, 90% more expensive than Arizona. How about Washington? 188% more expensive than Washington. This is with 33% renewables. We're now taking that to 50. Take that to 50 and take that blue line over and it bounces off this speaker over here. Now, you're a manufacturer, you don't want to have to pay that. One of the, the chairman of the board of uh, IEP, Brett Gooch, runs California Steel in Fontana. He has a thousand workers there. He has a $2 billion investment in the ground in Fontana. If he could leave, he would. Why? Because he starts out the year somewhere between 20 and $30 million more electrical cost than any other steel manufacturer in the world. Well, what does that do to the growth of manufacturing? It really hurts it. So those percentages that were higher, this is the Western United States, these are our nearby competitors. Still, we added manufacturing jobs. Why? Because we have land, so the spacer is cheaper, the work, we have a good labor force, and they're willing to come here. Out of the 50,000 created in the country, we created 10, or 40,000, we created 10,000. The idea that all these green jobs have been created in production, excuse me, those 10,000 jobs are not high-end green jobs. That's steel and very conventional sorts of things of that kind. It was 5% of our overall job growth. Medium pay, roughly 50,000 good paying jobs. Last year we created 4,250. This year I think it'll slow down and it's mostly because of the value of the dollar. And I may be being too conservative there. Here's a perfect example of the difficulty we face between logistics and manufacturing. That's an Apple computer. You see all those flags? That's where the parts come from that have been put together to form the computer. You see American flags in here occasionally. There's an American flag. There's an American flag. There's, there's two over there. This thing is made all over the world and put together in pieces as it moves around. And so it's really being assembled inside logistics facilities <coughs> as it moves around. Now, where is it made? Nowhere. <laughs> and everywhere. <laughs> Training issues in manufacturing. Here's our problem. The manufacturer generation is retiring. As they retire, what they're doing is leaving skilled jobs where we don't have anybody to replace them. So here we need these industry specified skills, occupations, and certifications. Defining the speed, the types of skills, what do we need? Mechanics, machinists, welders, electrical technicians, software techs, executive assistants, and again, soft skills, because I'm just on that theme today. <laughs> now, looking at construction. Here was our strongest sector that disappeared on us. But you, what do we see here? Negative equity, homes underwater, couldn't be sold. <coughs> Fourth quarter 2009, 2009, 54.9% of all our houses. Nobody, over half the people in that houses couldn't sell them if they wanted to. They'd own more if they sold it. It's down to 11.4. It's, it's getting cleaned up. What's happened is prices, which peaked at 389, fell to 155. That's over 60%. It's now from there to here back 83% at 284. It's still 26.9% below the peak, but we really don't need to get back to here because most of the houses that were sold in there have been lost because those are the people who use crazy financing to buy their houses. Here's why our region grows. San Bernardino County, middle priced house, fourth quarter of 2015, 275. Look at it, LA, 514. San Diego, 526. Orange, 703. That's how much people are saving if they migrate here from those counties. It's what's always driven the inland economy. However, we've not seen a sales breakout yet. You see it's just sort of 
hanging out, not really going anywhere. Uh, a lot of this has to do with FICO scores. The banks just won't lend to people that in the way they used to. And I'm told by the real estate guys that this is a major problem. The other one is FHA, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac, who finance most homes, have set the limit for this region at 350. Our middle price new homes are higher than that. So you can't qualify to buy them. Still, the sector is growing. Added 25,525, second largest job growth in the region. Pays really well, 51,000. Part of the reason that's paying so well is most of these projects are infrastructure or large facilities like you see in, in uh, logistics. My forecast, 8,500 more jobs in this field because we are seeing residential start to come back. Training, here again the issue is the loss of their workforce. People who work in construction are working in warehouses today or in driving trucks. So they need people to be able to develop the trade skills to industry standards. Some of that is union work. Some of that is non-union training that they need to have. Most home builders don't use union labor. Most of the big jobs are union labor. And of course, again, soft skills. Along with that is the financial sectors. Uh, the financial sectors, 2% of growth, not a great deal. Uh, 48,000, they pay well. These sectors are driven by construction to a large extent. As it comes back, they'll come back. They were very strong during a good part of the last decade. Training issue here, no one's doing middle management training in finance, insurance, real estate, those sorts of things. Uh, again, you have the same things about what needs to be done, what kinds of skills, escrow, title, teller managers, loan officers, real estate agents and finance. Some of this is specialized training. The key thing here is getting people not working in retail or working in these places, but getting into the management piece of that puzzle. When I ran the business division at San Bernardino Valley College, we were training practically everybody in middle management in this region at Valley College, working with various industry groups, and they were telling us what they needed. We were organizing that with them, and we had a huge, I had 106 people work for me part-time at night out of industry, training all these different kinds of folks. Then there are the high paying sectors. This is our problem area. Our problem, frankly, is 19.9% of our, of our adults have a bachelor's or higher. We are competing with LA, Orange, San Diego, where it's 30 to 40. Why would a company come here when there's such a narrow group of people? And there's, that's, that's a difficulty we have. Now these guys, three of them, top level entrepreneurs. Jack Benjamin, Esri, and 2,000 workers. Borns and Riverside, very, very successful engineering company. Ahmad Abdel Al Khatib, interesting guy. He has a company where people can do two things. They completely understand programming and computers, and they can also tell you about it in English. <laughs> which if you know anybody in the computer business is a rare talent. He had, his people are making 150 to 200,000 a year right out of college. Where are they going? They're going to the West End to a large extent. Why, why are the higher end firms attracted there? Because that's where the labor force is moving. It's high end workers looking for upscale housing migrating to where those places are. A few of them down here in Marietta, Temecula, some over in Loma Linda and Redlands. But when you look at it, here's what's going on. Only 3.6% of our growth. Now, here there is a chicken and there is an egg. It's not a question of one or the other. If you can't get a better educated labor force, you will not draw the from the birds. It's that simple. And so a huge thing that we're working on at IEP is how do we change those dynamics? because this is really about college attainment, graduation, and all of the rest of that. 
Median pay, only 65000 Very good. I see the higher ed uh, piece of this adding 1,000 jobs, management and professions about 800. And here, of course, is the backbone to do all of this. First of all, you've got a lot of four-year institutions around here. Second of all, you've got a huge number of community colleges. Then they have what you guys do, K through 12. And then we have the private sector employers, some of whom are pretty good. Now, given that backbone, what's the strategy that we're looking at? Again, it's what I talked about before. Business convenes, gets the leaders together, single strategies, proposals to the legislature and the nonprofit, getting rid of competition, we'll supply the backup support, and we'll hire people who will who get certification. We use that for this. This was the Governor's Innovation Award. We called together a smattering of the superintendents, including both uh, Ted Alejandre from this county and Young from Riverside County. The meeting was chaired by the Chancellor of UCR, <coughs> Wilcox, the Chancellor of, uh, I mean, the President of Cal State, Tomas Rivera, and we had the Board of Directors of the IEP there. We said, all right, what are we going to do to start to move the educational ball forward to start get more people into college, staying in college, and graduating from college? We then listened to the education's, educators in the room argue for an hour and a half, <laughs> at which point the chairman of our board and I slammed our fist on the table and said, all right, what are we going to do? And that's why I say you almost have to have businesses at the table, because the educators, you guys, you're way too smart. You all have 53 different ideas of how to solve a problem. We're interested in, all right, what's step one? And so we put together out of that meeting this, put the grant together, fired it off to the governor. We eliminated competition from anybody else, so it would only be one from the Inland Empire. We didn't completely succeed. A couple of people went their own way. They got nothing. We got $5 million. We only asked for three. They only gave three or five five million dollar awards. Cal State, five, five of them in the state. And we got it because we put together that group of people working together. And that's how you were convinced this is the way this has to work. Strategic elements, we've got to have college completion. A to G requirements are a must. STEM, it's, if, if the kids want to go make some money, do STEM. You now, if you want to take ethnic studies or if you want to take uh, psychology or whatever, fine. But if you want to make good money, get into STEM and stay there. Cultural divide is a major problem for us. Uh, we're, we're right now at 49.4% of the Inland Empire is Hispanic. Another six to seven is African American. That is over half the population right there. The white Anglo population, which tends to want to run things, is now down to 33%, one third of the population. The growing group tends to be the, uh, uh, the new growing group is Asian, mostly in the West End so far. K through 12, community college and university uh, articulation is hugely important. And a piece of the problem has to be the parents. There's a program that I strongly recommend, and you may have your own, down in the Ontario Montclair school system, where the parents and the third grader sign up that the child's going to try and go to at least JP College. The requirement of the parent is to go to JP College and other schools once a year so they start to get used to the fact that that is not Mars. <laughs> it is not an alien place. <laughs> that it is a place their child will not be unfamiliar. If you look at the student bodies, they're as mixed up as the rest of us are. And so you're doing that with them from the third grade on. They've got metrics now. It has increased the college growing rate from 40% to 60% of the people that went all the way through that. That is a huge change that really did work. And it's a key piece, I suspect, of the issue. 
Then there are a few other sectors that are moderate pain. These are sectors, they're 4% of our growth is in K through 12 excess. That's not moderate pain. What did I do here? That's the wrong graph. Okay. The sectors I was trying to refer to are these. Eating and drinking, social assistance, retail trade, employment agencies, admin support, <coughs> services like auto mechanics, amusement, skiing lodges and stuff like that, theaters, accommodation, the hotel industry. These sectors don't pay well. However, with, within them, part of our problem is nobody's been training people to go to management in these fields. This is what I used to do at Valley College when I was running the department there back in the 60s. We did a lot of it. Real estate offices, bank tellers and loan offices, escrow title, preschool teachers, executive assistants. Oh, there they are. Only pay 28,000, but if you get into management, you get into decent jobs. So you have, sorry, I got things out of order here. Retail mid-managers. Somebody's running the department. Restaurant and fast food managers, hotel department managers, executive assistants, those, that category alone is huge. Virtually anybody you talk to that's in my kind of work wants somebody that understands Word, um, what is, what is it? Excel. Word, Excel, whatever the heck, all that tweeting and all the rest of that stuff. <laughs> I mean, I've, been, I've finally reached the point of idiocy. I don't understand about half of it. But having administrative assistants who can do this or executive assistants are worth their weight in gold and they're getting paid for it. And that is, that's a huge one there. So finally, there is no way the Inland Empire can become truly prosperous unless we can overcome the education challenge before us. That's my website. I'm going to put this up there so you can download it if it will be of help to you. It will be up there probably by next week. And if I can answer any questions, I'd love to try. Dr. Busey, within the Rialto, Fontana area, the surrounding cities, yeah. what industries do you see uh, growing specifically to those area codes? And what, what's the type of pay, the pay range or that you're seeing? Well, you see, it's, the, it's the sectors I've just gone through. I mean, it's logistics is going to be big around here, uh, already is, will continue to be. Um, and it has entry-level jobs, but you can move up in there into really good paying work within that field. Manufacturing, if you have the ability to get the skill sets that they need, they're losing their workforce. Their workforce is retired. Uh, then things like executive assistants, which really go across the board, everybody needs those. And that's, you know, it used to be secretaries. Forget secretaries. I'm talking about people who can, you know, care and feeding of the boss, who has by now no idea what half that technology does, except they really do need to have it work. So those sorts of things. Um, the you're not going to see the high end moving around here in a major way. Uh, the way that's going to work is we're getting a migration of a well-educated population, particularly in the West End. That sets up the condition for the companies that need an educated workforce to follow them. They started to do that back in the last housing cycle. And that's why all those offices went up. And then it happened to go up right into the teeth of recession and ended up being empty and a lot of them going into foreclosure. We're back into that part of the cycle again. We're starting to see a little of this move. Uh, part of the problem, frankly, has been the internet. We do so much more stuff on the internet now, you don't need as many people working in offices. And so the office stuff is a lot of it's going on online. That's why anything dealing with being able to use the technology is something that the students absolutely have to do. 
And it can't just be using our cell phone. They need to get into some of these, you know, like Word, Excel. PowerPoint, <laughs> Excel. I still use Lotus. I told you how old I am. <laughs> I used to teach it. So I do everything in Lotus and then convert it and ship it out. <laughs> but, yeah. Can you be more, a little more specific on what type of manufacturing occupations um, are here in our area? When you talk to the guys in the field, it is machinists, any, and there's many levels of that. Up through, I mean, at the top end, it's tool and die. At the beginning, it's the care and feeding of the machines. Uh, but definitely using the modern machines that are robotic to some extent. What's going along with that is, uh, what's the technology called where you, know, you can make a gun out of plastic? 3D printing. printing. Yeah. That's, uh, that's becoming big because what's happening is you can design the part and then build it in 3D and make it from out of that. So that's a major piece of it. Then you've got welding. Uh, and interestingly enough, I've talked with uh, one of the big welding companies and one of the things they said to me is they really like to have women because the guys are, big, are good at the big sort of throw yourself around type of work, but intricate work, the women are much better at it. And so they're looking for women that can do welding. So that's a big one. Um, let's see, what else is there? Electrical. Uh, electrical is is huge uh, in terms of being able to use, to work in electrical within a manufacturing setting. Uh, and remember, you've got several levels of all of this stuff. It, part of it is to be able to do the work. Part of it is to keep the equipment going that does the work. So those, those things interact. And frankly, the people who do that make more than the people actually using the equipment. Um, and then there's just the general category of software, understanding CAD and how all of that world works uh, is, again, very important. Um, any of that kind of technology, when you get into the job, they will start to teach you how they want it done. But if you come to them with that skill set, you're coming with something that's of value when you go in. Now, that's in the manufacturing field. When you get into logistics, in logistics, the whole information world has gotten hugely important. Uh, nobody, the, the technologies are changing so fast that they're having trouble keeping their own people up to speed on the technologies that they're using. Then when you get into to where the, the uh, uh, engines are, uh, I don't know if you've looked inside the hood of your car, but frankly, I'm afraid to. <laughs> but the fact is, all of that, whether it's auto mechanics and that sort of stuff, or if you're looking at truck engines, the truck engines have changed dramatically. That's why that you saw that huge decline. But uh, LNG, CNG, clean diesel, to be able to work on that kind of equipment, uh, those people make really good money. And you have a huge number of trucking companies right down the street in, in Fontana. I mean, it is sort of the, the headquarters of a lot of that. Uh, the truck drivers, which I know you guys can't train for, truck drivers' median pay for an 18-wheeler is 45000 half above, half below. And I did a thing just recently, did a study for the American Trucking Association, the California Trucking Association. There are guys making two hundred grand. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So just going back to the IEEP, um, how then does, uh, for the innovation projects and everything, how then does uh, our district become a part of that or at least have our students in part, uh, in, in with the, if they're offering internships or fellowships or apprenticeships yeah. in these fields with these business partners who are already at the table, how do we become a partner in that? The whole career pathways is designed to allow you to link into that. The other side of that is the obligation on her, because her job is to get the business side of that aligned with the, with the 
education side of it, the, the thing that we have changed in terms of point of view is to bring to the table the idea that the business community has to be a driver. They never have been. They've always complained about education, which has complained about business, and it's been ships in the night. And what we're trying to do is bridge that. And so we've been sort of edu doing and spending a lot of time educating <laughs> business about its happiness. And frankly, there's an awful lot of jobs that are going begging because there's not a qualified workforce to do them. And that's gonna become a bigger issue as the unemployment rate comes down because the people still unemployed are generally the least able and that's, that's why they're there. So it'll be through that sort of uh, mechanism, uh, generally through your superintendent, who will, you know, that's at the linkage that will be a part of the puzzle. Uh, we're working closely with Ted Alejandre and with, with Ken Young to move this whole thing forward. And we're looking at, and part of my obligation at all this, frankly, is I'm gonna be going out, as I said, talking to 75 companies. Now, believe me, that is a lot of work, one at a time. On the other hand, by the time that's done, I'll know more about this economy, again, than anybody, because I will have told it, been told it by the people who run it. And hopefully we will have uncovered exactly what you need to have in terms of exactly what sector <coughs> occupations were there. Part of the problem is we've always tried to do this with data. And to be honest, you can't do it with data. You need to go talk to the people and have them tell you what it is they're having trouble with. And that's essentially what, what I'm gonna be doing, just frankly, because I got nothing else to do. I'm 75 and I don't want to retire. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just real quick on the unemployment rate. The unadjusted unemployment rate, does unadjusted mean it's not being adjusted for those that are underemployed? No, no, there, there are two levels, there are two kinds of unemployment rates we use. Well, three. Seasonally adjusted simply says this. You get to January, and the number of people employed goes down. And the reporters say, oh, what's happening? The answer is, January happened. So we seasonally adjust to get that out. Well, we don't do that with the local data. It's too, it's too messy anyway. You do it with the national numbers, so I use the unadjusted national number to compare to our unadjusted, so you're not taking seasonal out of either one. What you're talking about is the difference between what we call U3 and U6. U3 says, I knock on your door, I ask you, are you willing to work? Are you able to work? Do you have a job? If you do, you're in the labor force and you're employed. If you say, no, I don't have a job, that doesn't mean you're unemployed. I then ask you, what did you do in the last 30 days to find a job? And if the answer is nothing, you're not unemployed. So U3 does not look at everyone who doesn't have a job. Maybe the, they may want one, but that's a qualification. U6 includes people who are wanting jobs and who haven't done something in the last 30 days. Also includes people working part-time who would rather be working full-time. The two track together <laughs> and they're about 5% apart, apart. So as ours has come down to like 5, 8, the other is probably sitting around 9 to 10. But it was over at 20, so it's come down as well. Thank you so very much. <laughs>
Good to see you again. <laughs> You're welcome. I know that, um, and you found out how bad you are because you can tell us. No, Marcia just wants a copy. Okay. okay. So bring him up. Like, just hand it down. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And welcome back. How are you? Airplane. What? No. Yeah. No. Um, uh, Piper. Piper. Yeah. Single engine Piper? Yeah. I'm there. All right. <laughs>